It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you. You know, uh, as I begin, uh, Speaker, I want to uh, congratulate uh, my new critic for finance, Vic Fideli, and my new critic for accountability, Doug Holliday. Welcome to the new position. You know, uh, Premier, you uh, basically had a press conference yesterday, and you said that if we don't pass uh, legislation from the last session on tanning beds and on a local food act that you'd call an election. Quite frankly, Premier, that's like Order. walking in here and saying, throwing up your hand saying that you've got no new ideas. You've spent the last eight months in conversations. You've spent the last three months of the summer on a province-wide hand-holding tour. Premier, you may have given everybody a group hug, but all you came back with was sore arms and no Western. new ideas. So if that's the best you can do, isn't it time to actually change this government and get our problems back? Yesterday's comment applied. Uh, there were other people in your own caucus speaking. Yesterday's uh, comment applied, so I will start right off by uh, going to the individual member. And a warning means the last time. Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I noticed that yeah, my arms are fine, actually. <laughs> I've got quite strong arms. I was on a canoe trip, and I was, it was good. <laughs> um, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I, I just want to clarify. I'm glad that the Leader of the uh, Opposition was paying attention to my, uh, to my press conference. I noticed that he couldn't actually deliver the question with a straight face, but, but I, <laughs> I appreciate that he listened. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, I was using that piece of legislation, which actually is a very important important piece of legislation, protecting kids from cancer and melanoma. It's very, very important. But I was using that piece of legislation, among others, as an example, Mr. Speaker, and it was an example of this, that there are many things that we can work together on. There is a lot of common ground, things that the uh, opposition party and yes, the third party have said that they agree on, on. I said, let's work on those things together. Let's make the legislature work. Well, thank you, Speaker. And when it comes to the tanning bed legislation, this is a government that wheeled out cancer patients to try to distract attention from your gas plant scandal. So please don't give us any lectures on that kind of hypocrisy. So you want to cooperate. You want to work together. Here's an idea for you, Premier, because you don't seem to have any ideas when it comes to jobs. The Green Energy Act is economic suicide. It's driving up our hydro rates, it's costing us jobs, it is tearing down communities right down the middle. If you did your big group hug across the province, I know you heard it. Will you join with us? Will you cooperate? And will you end the Green Energy Act to bring jobs back? Yeah. Hey, please. You see it, please? Premier? Mr. Speaker, we're not going to go backwards. I just came from a meeting called Meeting of the Minds that's happening at the Brickworks in Toronto. People from all over the world, Mr. Speaker, have come here because Ontario is a hub of sustainability. Ontario is developing technology in clean water, in transit, Mr. Speaker, and in green technology for energy, Mr. Speaker. We are exporting that knowledge. That is the future, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition seems to want to take us back. That's not where we're going, Mr. Speaker. We're going forward. We're tapping into our strengths. We're tapping into our innovative culture here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And those are the investments that we're going to make. Those are the investments we are making, Mr. Speaker. And we'll move ahead with him or without him, but we'd like to have him with us, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Uh, 
moving forward. You're barely treading water with your embrace of Dalton McGuinty's agenda. And you know what? We're drowning in runaway hydro costs. It's costing us jobs. Now, I know you're stuck in the past. You want to stick to the McGuinty agenda. You won't accept our new ideas on ending the Green Energy Act. Here's another one for you. Your College of Trades is nothing more than a giveaway to the special interests. It's going to stand in the way of young people getting good jobs. It has runaway costs and involved a new tax on anyone from electricians to hairstylists. You want to cooperate, you want good ideas, end that College of Trades boondoggle before it even gets going. Let me just talk about some of the things that I've been doing since I came into this office and the investments that we've been making. Investments in business, Mr. Speaker. $17.6 million to support business in regions across the province, and that's leveraging $133 million in investments and retaining and creating 2,800 jobs, Mr. Speaker. That's the kind of investment we need to make. $50 million in new venture capital. So the Leader of the Opposition talks about us being not us not moving forward in fact mr speaker he is stuck in the past he is not he does not have ideas for how to move forward how to create entrepreneurship how to make sure that capital gets invested in new ideas mr speaker that creates new business and new opportunities for people in the province that's what 50 million dollars of venture capital will do that's the kind of strategic investment Answer. that we're making to create jobs and create the conditions for jobs to be created mr speaker new question Leader of the opposition. Back, uh, back to the, uh, the, the Premier, Speaker. Uh, look, we put out over 200 pages of bold new ideas in our path to prosperity to turn our province around, to get our economy moving again. And you can't find one single idea. You don't want to cooperate. You want to be stuck in the past with the Dalton McGuinty agenda. Uh, giving you two ideas, you reject them out of hand. You rejected arbitration reform out of hand. You may have ridden around in your canoe, but you haven't actually brought forward one single new idea to get our economy going to get spending under control. So let me try one more time. I know you're running scared of the public sector union bosses. You're basically in their pockets. Why don't you stand in your place and say no, and you'll bring in and agree with the PCs at province-wide, across the board, wage trees that'll save us $2 billion a year right there. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, the, um, the underpinnings of what the Leader of the Opposition is talking about today and often talks about is that we should cut services, that we should fire workers, so we should fire 10,000 education workers, we should cancel programs and reduce those programs, reduce those services to people, and, Mr. Speaker, that we should undermine organized labour. That is one of the pillars of his philosophy. We don't, we don't hold with that, Mr. Speaker. We believe that organized labour, that workers working together have created safe workplaces over the decades. A lot of good has been done in the name of uh, collective bargaining. We believe in those processes, Mr. Speaker, but the Leader of the Opposition does not, and that is evident from those 200 pages that he has put out, and it's evident in every question that he asks in the House, Mr. Speaker. Let me um, give another example of how the Premier is running scared when it comes to the government union bosses in our province. The very same union bosses that held our kids hostage, that cancelled after-school activities, that cancelled graduations, that held our kids and our grandkids hostage, what did you do? You gave away the ship. You gave them a race. You ran scared from them, and you ran one of them as your candidate in London West. Hey, what does that say about your leadership? What does that say about your capacity to actually get the books back and balance the province? I mean, you want to cooperate, you want to get things done, people of Ontario, you want to balance the books, cancel that deal, we can't afford it, they shouldn't get a raise, they held our province hostage. Well, Mr. Speaker, I go back to, I go back to what I just said, that the premise of many of the Leader of the Opposition's questions is about creating discord in the public sector. It's about labour unrest. That's it's right. about breaking relationships that are in the best interests of our children, Mr. Speaker, and the students in our schools. It is in the best interests of the children in our schools and the students all across the province that we have a good working relationship. 
We, re we worked within the fiscal arrangement that we had put in place, Mr. Speaker. There was no additional money that went into the, uh, into the agreements. We came up with the savings that we had identified, but what we did, Mr. Speaker, was we changed the relationship. And what we've got, Mr. Speaker, is a working relationship with the education sector. We're going to maintain that yes, because sir. it's in the best interest of every single child who's starting school today, who's been in school, and every student in this province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. No, Premier, respectfully, what we got is you gave away the store. We got the biggest deficits and debts we've ever had in the history of the province of Ontario. Can't afford it. It's got to come to an end. You want to cooperate, you want to get things done. I put idea after idea on the floor to bring accountability for taxpayers, to get our economy moving again. You've gone across the province now, Premier, for eight months. You've given a lot of group hugs. It's time for action. We've got ideas. If you don't, we're ready to go. Let's actually put those ideas on the table and turn our province around, get our books back in balance, and our great province, Ontario, will lead again. That's our plan. Here's yours. Premier? Mr. Speaker, and I spoke about a couple of the things that we have done. Um, investing in infrastructure, investing in business, investing in people, Mr. Speaker. If we do those things, and if we do them strategically, as we have been. So, for example, the investments in infrastructure that will come from the $100 million fund, Mr. Speaker, for municipal, bridges, roads, and important infrastructure. That's something that I have heard about, Mr. Speaker, for a number of years when I was Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, when I was Minister of Transportation. I would think that it would be the kind of thing that the Leader of the Opposition actually would support, because it is going to support rural and northern municipalities who have ageing infrastructure and who know that that infrastructure is one of the conditions to bring business to their communities. So $100 million a year is a significant, significant Answer, investment in that infrastructure. That's the kind of thing that Answer. I would have thought that the Leader of the Opposition would have Somebody supported, and it's the kind of thing, Mr. Speaker, that we are going to continue to do. Because because that's what will create jobs, it will create opportunity in every community across the province. The question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is to the Premier. Uh, as the Premier knows, we expect the Legislature to deliver the results that she promised Ontarians this session. So could she just take a, maybe a minute or so to explain exactly what her priorities are, Speaker? Premier. Mr. Speaker, I think I've been doing that. I've said that investing in people, investing in business, investing in infrastructure, those are, those are the priorities that I believe will get the, econ the economy going, will create jobs, Mr. Speaker, and that is already happening. The investments that we are making, the support that we're putting in place, the changes that we're making, Mr. Speaker, is what is going to create those jobs and help people in their day-to-day -day lives. That's our priority, and whether it's creating uh, more opportunities and more uh, services in home care, Mr. Speaker, or whether it's the Youth Employment Fund, or whether it's investments in transit, Mr. Speaker, those are the kinds of things that are going to get the economy going, are going to create jobs across the province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, media reports this week laid out some of the government's supposed priorities for this session, and they included lowering auto insurance rates, establishing a financial accountability office, and getting to work on putting people to work. Uh, those are the things that topped the list. Now, every one of those is a new Democrat idea, a new Democrat initiative. The Premier's own projects. Projects like her plan to hit families with new unfair taxes and road tolls are nowhere to be seen. Does the Premier have some secret priorities of her own that she hasn't yet shared with us, or does she sincerely expect people to believe that new Democrats are trying to stop to order. the government from implementing measures that we forced them to adopt in the first place? <laughs> Thank, you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, you know, it's tempting to have a uh, an ongoing debate about whose idea it was to support young people getting into work, Mr. Speaker. But I can tell you, that is something that we have been talking about for a long time. The, the leader of the third party can, own, to, can claim it for her own, but the fact is, it is an idea that needs to be acted on. We found common ground on it. It's in our budget, as is our commitment to investing in transit. And that, Mr. Speaker, is an idea that I have not heard the leader of the third party talk about. Investing in infrastructure, investing in transit, 
that we know is critical to the economy of this region, but also, Mr. Speaker, to the economy of the province. That's an idea that we are acting on and that did not come from anywhere except Answer. from these benches, Mr. Yeah, yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, here's what people see. A government that's promised action on jobs but seems more interested in photo ops than job creation. A government that's promised to close corporate tax loopholes but can't be bothered to even close any. A government that's promised to make life affordable and lower auto insurance rates but seems more interested in protecting industry profits than drivers' wallets. Now, is the Premier interested in actually delivering results, no. or does she just want to play the same old games that help the Ontario Liberals hold on to power exactly. and leave Ontarians falling further and further behind? So, Mr. Speaker, I know that the leader of the third party understands that the 43,600 jobs, net new jobs that were created in Ontario, are a result of good policies, good fundamentals, and our recovery from the economic downturn, Mr. Speaker. And I know she will give credit to the people of Ontario and the businesses of Ontario for creating those jobs, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to support those businesses and to support the people of Ontario in that good work. And part of that is creating the conditions so that new jobs can be created, and that part of that is investing in transit. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party also knows that the reduction in auto insurance that we have committed to is underway, Mr. Speaker. We have made that commitment. The Minister of Finance has, has outlined the way that we're going to get there. We're acting on that. It was in our budget, and we will continue to remove the cost from the system that will allow those average auto insurance costs to go down. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third party. Thank you so much, Speaker. Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier. Uh, yesterday in this place, the Premier said she will, quote, make sure uh, that as questions are asked, they get answered. But when it comes to the actions of certain senior Liberal insiders, some pretty key questions simply aren't being answered. Does the Premier think that's acceptable, Speaker? Premier. I'd love to answer that question, Mr. Speaker, but I don't actually know what the leader of the third party is talking about. I will just say, in general, in general, Mr. Speaker, when there are questions that are asked, we want the answers to be forthcoming. That's what I've said all along. If she's talking about the, uh, if she's talking about questions at committee, Mr. Speaker, we have we have provided the opportunity for uh, for questions to be asked of me and many of my colleagues, the former premier. And we will absolutely continue to answer questions as they are asked. If the leader of the third party wants to be more specific, I'll be more specific in my answer. Final, final uh, supplementary, sorry. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Well, the Premier can actually keep her promise. She can make sure that when questions are asked, they get answered. She can tell her government house leader to put this on the table and make it clear. Uh, that questions about emails concerning senior Liberals and their attempts to get the Speaker to fall in line are actually answered. Now, will the Premier? Stop. Um, I'd like to remind the leader of the third party that the ruling has been made, and that that particular reference should not be used in the House. So, I would ask the member to rephrase the question, please. Rephrase the question, please. I'm asking the Premier to allow questions to be asked at committee. This has got nothing to do with the point of privilege, Premier. That what this has got to do with is making sure that your promise that people's answers will be had, that their questions will be answered, actually occurs. And that's something that you have promised, and it's something you can see happen. As a leader, as a Premier, make sure that the answers come to committee. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I have been categorical in my support for an open process at committee. The committee makes its decisions. The committee works within the rules, Mr. Speaker. The chair of the committee works within the rules. The committee works with the clerk's office, Mr. Speaker, and that process has to unfold within the rules. I am completely supportive of questions that are being asked being answered, but the committee has to operate as an entity with the advice of the clerk, Mr. Exactly. Speaker. Thank you. Your question? Supplementary. The, the Premier has a pretty easy choice. She can keep protecting Liberal insiders or she can open up the gas plant committee so that when questions are asked, 
they actually get answered. What is this Premier going to do? Is she going to continue to protect Liberal insiders, or is she going to take that leadership role that she likes to brag about, about transparency and openness and answering all the questions, and actually make sure that committee is able to ask the important questions and get them answered? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I will just I will just reinforce what I said, which is the committee has my blessing and my support and my encouragement to do its work. When I came into this office, I opened up the process. In fact, Mr. Speaker, there have been 135,000 documents that have, have gone to committee, 32 motions, 53 witnesses, 90 hours, Mr. Speaker. That committee has the right to do its work, and as I say, I encourage that work, Mr. Speaker. What I do take some offence at is the allegation that somehow I'm protecting or obstructing that process. That is not the case, Mr. Speaker. It is quite to the contrary. I have opened up the process. I want those questions answered. But you know, Mr. Speaker, what yes, I also sir. want is for us to be able to do the work of the people of Ontario, make sure that we, we move forward and we make the investments and put the supports in place so we can create jobs and we can help people in their lives. Question to member from Dickinson. Thank you. Uh, This morning is for the Premier, uh, Speaker. Five years ago this week, the world entered its deepest financial crisis in 80 years. Families suffered and Ontario suffered. Since then, other jurisdictions made the hard choices. They cut spending, they restored jobs and prosperity to taxpayers, but not Ontario. Stop the clock. Attorney General, come to order. The member for Etobicoke North will come to order. Continue, please. Your government has saddled this province with over $250 billion of debt with no plan to balance the budget, no plan to restore lost manufacturing jobs, no plan to provide hope for Ontario's youth. Even the Toronto Star today is questioning your lack of a plan and your, quote, piecemeal approach to governing. Premier, here's your chance. Question. Tell the people of Ontario which drastic cuts you plan to balance the budget. Uh, Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate the member on his new appointment as uh, critic to the Finance Committee. I look forward to a very collaborative approach in working on behalf of all Ontarians for the benefit of Ontarians. And one of the ways we do that, Mr. Speaker, is to be, is to be very careful and very honest in terms of what has been achieved. The member talks about having a plan which we've outlined very clearly in this budget. We have a six-point plan that talks about the, uh, the path to balance. More importantly, Mr. Speaker, this afternoon, we have released our public accounts, an audited statement talking about the achievements that this government has been able to do over the course of the last number of years as it relates to the budget and it relates to the decisions that we've made. Tough decisions that the opposition have not been prepared to make, but we have done so. We have done so in a very balanced approach and a very fair approach, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, well, Premier, uh, Premier, let me refresh your memory. While governments around the world focused on rebuilding their economies, your government focused on keeping Liberal operatives employed, pouring or $585 million into ga cancelled gas plants. While families wondered how they would plan for retirement or fund their children's education, unelected Liberals plotted to hijack an election, treating taxpayers' dollars like Liberal Party donations. Good jobs keep leaving our province, and young people are leaving to follow that work. Your overspending is now hurting the things Ontarians care about. Look at your cuts to physiotherapy services. Minister All the your government can do is simply from jump from one order, scandal to another. Premier, level with us. Are you just too busy protecting liberal interests Question. to be bothered to work on creating jobs and economic growth for Ontario? Minister Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, 
<laughs> the province has been, and the people of Ontario, more importantly, have been working very hard to ensure its recovery. The member opposite has just contradicted himself twice. On the one hand, they want across-the-board cuts that would hamper our sensitive recovery. On the other hand, they complain when cuts occur. You can't have it both ways. You can't suck and blow. We need to ensure a balanced recovery. And as a result of those decisions, Mr. Speaker, 180 per cent of those jobs have been recovered. 477,000 net new jobs have occurred. And we have maintained and we have been very direct and very strategic in our investments, which has enabled us to be more competitive in the long term. That is what's important, is the dividend that's going to accrue of those investments to afford the debt that's been accumulated. And we are going to consider and we're going to take every action necessary to, to protect Ontario. Your question, the member from Trinity East Predominant. The uh, Minister of uh, Transportation and Infrastructure. $85 million have been spent to create a transit plan for Scarborough. But last week, the minister drew a line and two dots on a map and happily flushed this $85 million down the, uh, the toilet. Will the minister tell Ontarians how much of their money he will waste in total <laughs> as he pursues a shortened, delayed, and technologically uncertain subway? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We've been working very closely with Metrolinx, with places to grow. We've identified uh, through our I-Corridor uh, system, Mr. Speaker, which is now one of the most advanced planning tools, the optimal route. Metrolinx's desire, I think, in their communications with me to this point, is to try to not change the plan again, so we're sticking with the original route. I think there's a strong agreement that in places to grow the Scarborough Town Centre is the focal point of intensification in the renewal of Scarborough and the creation of jobs. Uh, we have the Ministry of Transportation working. Uh, this is an evidence-based system, Mr. Speaker. No one's drawn line on the map. This is millions of dollars in planning in a, in a plan that is on that route. Mr. Speaker, what we're doing to comply with many of the New Democrats and City Hall's demands on us is changing the technology, Mr. Speaker, and running on the same line. I don't think this is complicated, Mr. Speaker. This is pretty straightforward. This will cost about $1.8 billion. You see there, please. Supplementary. A responsible minister, indeed a responsible government, would take a moment to consider the costs it, Minister yeah, of Training, yeah, College, yeah. Universities, come to order. To consider the costs, just want you to stop. Delays and risks associated with a major change to an infrastructure investment, particularly after the gas plant fiasco in Mississauga and Oakville. We know taxpayers will be on the hook for at least 85 million to derail a transit pl transit plans in Scarborough. Can the minister tell Ontari Ontarians exactly? what the total cost will be for the confusion, the chaos, and the delays, and the waste of the minister's transit musings. Um, Mr. Speaker, we have, and I think my colleagues from Scarborough will tell you, because most of them here have been working on this for over 20 years as city councillors, to deliver on the promises of many, which is to deliver a properly well-planned subway to the Scarborough Town Centre, which is what we're doing, Mr. Speaker, and to do it cost-effectively and to use it. Mr. Speaker, I would invite the member opposite to join me this afternoon at the Meeting of the Minds, where I will be outlining and demonstrating Geoportal and I-Corridor and our advanced pl planning techniques. This government, Mr. Speaker, is prepared to go forward, further into an open data model, which my friend Minister Malloy is leading. I am confused, Mr. Speaker, only by one thing here. I am confused about what it is the NDP is doing in Scarborough. Do you support a subway? Do you not support a subway? How would you finance it? Where is the money coming from? What is the alignment you will use? I am absolutely bewildered by the 15 different positions yes, the NDP seems to have on this, Mr. Speaker. When they have one, maybe we can have a conversation. Thank you. New question, the member from Scarborough Lake Report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Speaker, as the new school year begins, we are reminded that our collective responsibility to ensure the safety of our students in the classroom. As a former school board trustee, I know that our school boards 
principals and teachers take school ser safety seriously and have measures in place to make sure our students are protected. Paul Harvey, principal of one of my school at Tam Shanty Public School, my riding of Scarborough Agent Court, tells me that parents drop off their sons and daughters in their school. It takes comfort to know that our schools are locked during the school hours. This gives parents the confidence that they deserve and that protect our students. Parents in my riding also want to know what our government is doing to ensure that our students are safe in the learning environment. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Education, can she please inform the House Question. what our government is doing to ensure our schools are safe? Minister of Education. Yes, thank you, Speaker. And the member from Scarborough Agent Court is absolutely right that the safety of our students must be our top priority. Indeed. Our government has worked very hard to make our schools some of the safest in the world. So last year, we reopened the Safe Welcome program with an additional investment of $10 million to give school staff more control over who enters the school during school hours. I'm pleased to report that over 3,300 elementary schools in Ontario who have received funding from this program now have the safe welcome uh, equipment installed in their schools. Any school that receives this funding locks their doors during school hours in order to rig strict access through the school office and to keep their school safe. Answer. All school boards in Ontario are also required to have emergency lockdown protocols in place, which they work out with the local police force, and Thank we you. provided $1.7 million to support Bravo. training. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the Minister for her response and also congratulate on reopening the Safe Welcoming Program and all the work she has done to ensure our schools are safe. Speaker, a comprehensive approach to school safety is very important to the, every member of this House. The security of school is paramount, but we also need to have a positive school climate inside and outside the classroom helping our students to succeed. Many parents in my community are concerned about bullying in our schools and want to ensure the students have the support they need. Incident of bullying come with harmful effects, Mr. Speaker. Our students feel isolated and afraid to come to school. Ms. Zhang, a teacher at Highland Heights Public Schools, in my writing, said, quote, I work very hard to provide a safe and encouraging environment for all my students to learn because I know when a student is bullied and is fearful, their academics and social well-being will suffer. Question. Mr. Speaker, to you to the minister, can she tell the House what this government is doing to combat bullying, both inside and outside the classroom. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the, the member for this really important question. Because every student in Ontario has the re right to feel safe and accepted while they're at school. And that's exactly why our government passed the uh, Accepting Schools Act just last year. This legislation ensures that all school boards have policies and procedures in place for bullying prevention and intervention. For the first time ever, we have defined bullying in legislation so that every student, every teacher, every principal, and every parent knows exactly what we are talking about when we say bullying is not okay in our schools. The definition also includes a definition of cyberbullying because we know that bullying that takes place over the internet out of school also has an impact on the school climate. So we are making sure that we build a positive school climate. Thank you. Your question, the member from Dakota College, sir. Premier. Madam Premier, you are spending $10 billion taxpayer dollars each year paying down the debt on the interest of the runaway uh, debt that the Liberals have run up. You say your government is committed to transit. Maybe you could tell transit riders how many kilometres of subway could be built with $10 million. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure who, the, who should be taking that question, so I will take the question, Mr. Speaker, because uh, I think what it's about, Mr. Speaker, is 
questioning the advisability of investing in transit. And Mr. Speaker, I believe and we believe on this side of the House that transit is a critical condition for economic growth in this region and in fact, Mr. Speaker, in many parts of the in many parts of the province. So, Mr. Speaker, we're not going to back away from investing in transit. We are on track to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. Uh, the Minister of Finance is going to present the public accounts this afternoon, and uh, the member opposite will be able to see that. But the fact is, Mr. Speaker, if we don't make yes, these sir. investments, if we don't invest in transit and the other conditions for growth, then we will not grow the economy and we will not create those jobs. And I'm not willing to go there, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Right. Madam Speaker, we can't build transit if you don't get your runaway spending under control. Without a sound plan for this province, you can't deliver the solutions Toronto so desperately needs. You and your government had 10 years to build subways in this city, but you spent 10 years running up the debt instead. Now your transportation minister makes a new, confusing announcement each week. You've spent 10 years throwing away money we could have spent on subways. Why should transit riders trust you now? Well, you see it, please? Please. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think the member opposite should talk to the people in Brampton, in Mississauga, the people who are taking the GO train from Kitchener-Waterloo, the people who are taking the GO train from Barrie, the people who are going to be taking the subway to uh, York University, Mr. Speaker. I think the member opposite should talk to those people about the investments that this government has made. The fact is that subsequent governments, government after government in this legislature, did not invest in transit or, Mr. Speaker, started to invest in transit and then filled in the holes, Mr. Speaker. And So we have we have been investing in transit since we came into this office. The fact is that there are some contentious lines Answer. and we have made decisions. Mr. Speaker, without the help, I must say, of any consistency from the City Council, of which the member opposite was a member. Thank Mr. You. Speaker, we will continue to invest in transit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Premier, you've recently indicated your support for a PC private member's bill that would dismantle a long-standing collective agreement between Ellis Don and several building trades in this province. Your government has a record now of joining with the PCs to subvert and circumvent collective bargaining rights, as it did last year with our province's teachers with the imposition of Bill 115. Premier, can you explain why the passage of a Conservative private member's bill, custom built for the benefit of a singular company, is one of your key priorities. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, as I said yesterday when I was asked about this question uh, by the press, um, this is a, an anomalous situation that arose out of a decision that was made in, in the 1950s, Mr. Speaker. And uh, my understanding of the uh, private member's bill is that it would rectify that situation and would actually level the playing field in terms of the construction industry in the province. And to me, Mr. Speaker, it only makes sense for there to be some fairness in uh, uh, in the, the system, and so that's what this uh, private members would, bill would do. And in fact, the Labor Relations Board gave Ellis Dawn, I believe, two years to to, to, to approach the legislature to make this change. So it's an anomaly that needs to be fixed in order to level the playing field, Mr. Speaker. Here's supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, you said you said that your tenure as the Premier was going to be different from your predecessor, but it seems that uh, bargaining rights in this province are no safer now than they were when Dalton McGuinty was the Premier. Premier, the people of the province of Ontario sent us here to deliver results, and they're concerned. They're concerned when they see Liberals and Conservatives joining together, working overtime to pass a bill that helps one single company, especially when the women and men for, who work for that company have a major problem with this bill. Even the member from Lanark, even the member from Lanark has a problem with this bill. Premier, 
Why is it that you're so determined to team up with the Hudak Conservatives to ram this bill through? You know, Mr. Speaker, I understand the politics of trying to make this into an ideological fight. That's not what it is, Mr. Speaker. It's a practical solution to an anomalous situation that happened many, many years ago before Absolutely. the member was it's born. I, however, was born. <laughs> and, Mr. Speaker, it needs to be corrected. It need, we need to make sure that there's a level playing field in the construction industry. And I'm a practical politician, Mr. Speaker. I'm not going to get trapped in ideological rants because when there's a practical solution to a problem, let's work on that. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we're supporting the private member bill. Thank you. No question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Minister, as you know, there are a great many young people in my great riding of Oak Ridges Markham who attend post-secondary institutions across the province. Some of these individuals are in tough financial positions and rely on the support of the Ontario Student Assistance Program, or OSAP. Sometimes staying in school is still a struggle and we need to address the changing needs of our society. Minister, can you please tell me what steps the government is taking to increase accessibility to post-secondary education in our province to ensure all students have the opportunities they need to succeed? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for, for an excellent question. Our government is very committed, Mr. Speaker, to making sure that our post-secondary education system is accessible to all our students on the basis of ability to learn, not ability to pay. Uh, helping Ontario students with the cost of tuition is part of our plan to keep post-secondary education accessible and affordable for all of our families. That leads, frankly, to a stronger economy, Mr. Speaker, and it creates good jobs. Since we introduced the 30 per cent off tuition grant in January 2012, 230,000 students across Ontario of low and middle incomes, Mr. Speaker, have benefited. That's pretty spectacular, Mr. Speaker. It's a lot of help to our students. Since 2003, our investments have more than doubled the number of students qualifying for aid, while enrollment has increased by 40 per cent. Despite tough fiscal times, this government will continue to ensure that our students have access to affordable and high-quality post-secondary education Excellent. for all of our students. Thank you. Supplementary. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm pleased to hear that we are working to make post-secondary education even more financially accessible to create equal opportunities for all students across Ontario. Each year in my great riding of Oak Ridge's Markham, there are an increasing number of students preparing to enter their final year of post-secondary education. These stu students need to know that on graduation, they will have access to good jobs and have the assistance they need to pay off their loans. However, some students will still find it difficult to accomplish this promptly. Minister, what steps are being taken to support these students as they transition out of the post-secondary system and into the workforce? Good thank you. Question. Minister. Good. Again, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for another good question. While our students to, uh, work towards obtaining a high-quality education, it's our responsibility to ensure that we provide necessary assistance after graduation. That's why we've created the Ontario Student Opportunity Grant to limit OSAP debt and the repayment assistance plan to reduce the burden on our students. Uh, this program provides young people with income-sensitive support during the repayment of, of their loans. We've also created, and we just announced this past summer, the Youth Employment Fund to provide 25,000 young people with an entry point to long-term employment through job place, placements that offer a chance to, to learn work skills experience that the real workplace and earn an income at the same time. Our government remains committed to supporting young people as they work to build their lives and careers debt-free in Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to keep doing everything we can through our youth job strategy and to ensure that our young people get a great start, get into that workplace and help us build a stronger economy for those young people today and for us into Thank the future. You. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No question. The member from Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, you can stand here in this House and say that you've learned from your mistakes, but the stark reality is that if you had the opportunity to cancel gas plants along, came along again, you'd cancel them again, stick taxpayers with the bill again, and worry about the fallout afterwards. After Liberal backroom spinmaster Don Guy admitted to the cancelling of the Mississauga gas plant without knowing the full cost, the member from Nipissing answered, it's no wonder the Liberals continue to raise taxes. 
And shockingly, Mr. Speaker, the member from Vaughan interjected, and we win elections. Can you believe that, Mr. Speaker? This shows exactly how little regard the member for Vaughan has for the taxpayers of this province. Yeah, that pouring $600 million yeah, down yeah, yeah. the drain is all in a day's work. This is the culture of the Liberal Party. If you win the election, Question. nothing else matters. So, Premier, since you were busy dialing up the election rhetoric yesterday, can you tell us what you have planned to buy votes in the next election? You know, Mr. Speaker, I'd, I'd, I'd like to share with members uh, a story of what happened to me this summer. I was at a barbecue and a constituent came up to me and said, you know, on this gas plant issue, I was shocked to learn that both the Tories and the NDP wanted to cancel it as well. You should tell that story, Mr. Speaker, so I plan to tell that story. I have here a brochure for Mary Ann Monty Whalen, the Ontario PC candidate. She said the only party that will stop the sure way power plant is the Ontario PC party. On October 6, vote Ontario PC. I have Jeff Yanisik, Mr. Speaker, the candidate in Mississauga South for the Conservatives, and he said, I quote, only Conservative leader Tim Hudak will cancel the Eastern Power gas plant slated to be built Answer. on Lorland Avenue. And Mr. Speaker, I can go on and I will in the supplementary because, Mr. Speaker, it was a promise they made Thank and you. one that we kept. Supplementary. Well, I hope the government house leader told that person at that barbecue that you cited the gas plants there that cost half a million dollars, half a billion dollars to cancel. But back to the Premier. Premier, your government is incapable of coming clean with the to the public. You're not transparent just because you use the word transparent. Actions speak louder than words, and yours is a government that has tried to sell a myth. A government that releases public numbers they knew to be low while concealing the true cost. A government that says it wants to have all the answers, but then stalls and respects what can be asked in committee. A government that says they've released all the documents even after systematically deleting emails so the truth will be lost forever. I have little interest in the number of documents you've handed over if 50 to 100 of the most incriminating have been deleted forever. So, Premier, how can we believe anything you say Our when your actions are the exact opposite of your rhetoric? Mr. Speaker. Where's the emails on the 407? This is one of my favorite. The text of the Mississauga South PC candidate robocall. They know a lot about robocalls over here. Hi there. This is Jeff Yanisik, your Mississauga South Ontario PC candidate. I'm calling about the McGuinty Souza power plant that the Liberal government decided to build in your backyard. I'm against this power plant, and as your MPP, I will fight to stop the power plant from being built. Our team has been knocking, has been out knocking on doors every single evening for several months, talking about the power plant and making sure that we defeat the Liberals in this riding and put an end to their bad decisions. Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is that all parties in this House oppose that power plant. Plan. They, the PCs, claim they were the only ones that would stop it. Answer. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we welcome the new member to their uh, ranks from Etobicoke Lakeshore, who himself opposed the power plant. Oh. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, 19 power plants were cited, and 17 Thank of them you. were done correctly. No question. The member from Hamilton Mount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Children's Aid Societies across the province are facing deep cuts to services following a $50 million cut by this government. For the last five months, some of our province's most vulnerable children in Hamilton, London, Thunder Bay, Niagara, Waterloo, and more than a dozen other communities are facing a future without the support they need. My question is simple. Why does the government think it's okay to throw away hundreds of millions of dollars in gas plant scandals but cut services to our most vulnerable children? Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister of Children's Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. And we've had this discussion in this House in the last session with respect to the funding for the uh, CASs across the province. Our funding for the CASs has not been cut. We know that. Our investments still stand at $1.5 billion. That budget has not been cut. 
We know that. We are implementing a new funding formula to make it more equitable, to make it fair across the province. In the past, it has been based on historical expenditures. We are now basing it on community factors, socioeconomic factors, and variables that will make it fair. Through this, we are doing it in a fair way. We are transitioning this across the province over the next five years. These are changes that have been recommended by a commission. These are changes that have been approved and recommended through the OACAS. Supplementary. A member from Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the minister as well. In my well and riding, a regionalized, specialized facility for young people in foster care will be shut down in November, resulting in the layoff of 20 of 45 staff. This 37-year-old facility has been a fixture in Welland and Niagara, and as the spokesperson for Family and Children's Services is reported as commenting, the centre was closed not because, um, because it was not financially viable any longer. To be clear, this decision is not being made in order to improve outcomes for the 20 youth in this centre home. So um, what does the minister have to say to the youth? to the families, Question. to the workers, and to the local long-standing service who says it has no other choice but to close the doors. Thank you. Minister. Thank you for that question. Let me reiterate that our priority is for our children, our children that are in service. Now, with respect to that, are the kids are not being put at risk. Those beds are not being being lost. In this case, the services and supports previously offered are going to be transferred to a nearby facility. Child protection services will not be affected. The changes in the system will help create a more viable and sustainable child welfare system, something that I think all of us are working towards. So, Minister, I think our overall provincial investment in this province is not changing. It remains the same. We're making it fair across the province, and we will always keep children at the centre of all the decisions that we make with respect to funding in this province. Thank you. The member from Ottawa, Louise. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. I know that Ontario has been concerned about the non-consensual distribution of intimate images for a number of years. I also acknowledge that we have asked the federal government since 2011 to amend the criminal code to protect the people of Ontario from the harms of cyberbullying. Mr. Speaker, could the Attorney General please provide us with an update on the issue and what improvements our government has made in criminalizing the non-consensual distribution of intimate images? Thank you. Attorney General. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I know that this member is uh, concerned about this issue, as we all are in this House. Uh, it's, uh, I guess, as the result of technology, this kind of situations have been uh, are, are existing right now, and something definitely should be done about this. Uh, he's quite correct that since 2011, uh, both the Attorney Generals uh, of the day, as well as the Minister of Community Safety, uh, mi uh, the Minister of Women's Issues, have been calling upon the federal government to amend the criminal code to make it an offence to distribute intimate photos or video recordings of a person uh, without that person's consent. The issue has been raised a number of times at federal provincial meetings. Uh, uh, I know I've uh, had a, a recent correspondence from the Minister of uh, uh, the Attorney General uh, from Nova Scotia as well. This issue will be raised again at our fall meetings, and we hope that uh, yes, during sir. this session of the uh, federal parliament that this issue will be addressed and that a law will be uh, made to uh, make this an offence, Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Attorney General for that answer. I'm happy to hear that uh, this government's continued commitment to amend the criminal code in order to make it an offence to distribute non-consensual images. I know that taking action on this issue is a vital step in upholding this government's commitment to ensure our children are able to thrive in schools and communities that are safe, inclusive and accepting. I understand that the Coordinating Committee of Senior Officials CCSO, Cybercrime Working Group released a report along with recommendations on cyberbullying. Could the Attorney General please comment on the findings of the report? Well, he's quite correct. The, uh, the coordinating committee is a committee of senior officials uh, in all the various ministries of the Attorney General around the, this country. They've been working very diligently 
uh, on behalf of the uh, federal, provincial, uh, territorial uh, organization uh, to deal with this issue. They've come up with a report uh, that recommends that a new criminal offence be developed in order to address this issue in the criminal code. I intend to take up this issue with the uh, a federal attorney general, the new attorney general, Peter McKay, as well, uh, within the near future. We hope that uh, the federal parliament will deal with this issue this, this year. Uh, I think it has the, uh, uh, the uh, support of all members of the federal house as well. It should be dealt with. It's all about protecting our children and protecting uh, the, uh, you know, our children, especially, especially in light of the tragic events that have occurred in various parts of this country over the last number of years. So hopefully a, a bill will be passed federally so that we can deal with this issue once and for all. Answer. Thank you. Question. The member from Leeds, Grenville. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, it's been uh, three weeks since the Association of Municipalities of Ontario conference where municipal leaders told you loud and clear that Ontario's broken arbitration system must be fixed. Their beleaguered taxpayers can't afford a system awarding contracts that ignore the economic realities in communities like Scugog, where firefighters received a 26.7% increase. Wow. It's the top priority for municipalities, and given the urgency, I actually expected that you would table an arbitration reform bill yesterday on the first day that we're back in the legislature. But just as you did when you voted against our Capacity to Pay Act last spring, you've let our municipal partners down. So, Premier, can you tell me, and mayors from small, large communities, Question. communities in every corner of our province, why arbitration reform isn't a priority for you? Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for asking this very important question, an issue that, uh, that I've been engaged uh, in conversations uh, with uh, our municipal leaders uh, as well all through the summer, and especially at the AMO. Uh, Speaker, it's important that we, we remember some, some important uh, information Order. that will be helpful for all members uh, as we uh, uh, chart a path forward on this important issue. Um, as for the most part, Speaker, uh, the from system Renfrew, that is in play order. has worked. 97% of agreements being reached without any labor disruption. I think it's very important to, to remember that. And we know that the majority of police and firefighter agreements are reached, Speaker, at the bargaining table without ever going to arbitration. Yeah. Uh, and that's something I, I think it's important. We need to make sure, speak, uh, Speaker, Answer. the conditions for fair bargaining is always there at the table where municipalities and first responders are able uh, to negotiate an agreement and provide those vital services to our communities. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Speaker. I, I'm sorry, Premier, and I'm sorry, Minister. That's not good enough. It's actions, not words, that count. We don't need another conversation. We need to get to work. Ontario PCs put a solution on the table in Bill 44 last spring. We handed AMO the pen, and that bill contained everything that they wanted. But you teamed up with the NDP to defeat AMO's bill. Our House Leader, Mr. Wilson, he's committed that if you bring forward a bill with the reforms contained in Bill 44, we'll support it. That's the arbitration bill that AMO and mayors wanted. So I ask again, will you make it happen? Well, Speaker, uh, selective memory is, is something that I think we all suffer in this hall once in a while. I do want to remind uh, this member that last spring in 2012, when we brought some very specific reforms to the interest arbitration system to make it timely, fair, and transparent, that party, the opposition party, teamed with the NDP and voted down those reforms. And if those reforms would have been in place today, Speaker, a lot of the issues they're raising would have disappeared uh, by now. But we want to move forward. From Simple Gray, come to order. We want to move forward. We want to make sure that we are working very closely with uh, with AMO and Fire and Police. We're bringing them together around the table so that Answer. we can have. Uh, some healthy conversation so we can determine what's the, the right set of reforms uh, that we can develop together Thank and you. present to this House in the future. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. 
For more than a decade, consumers across this province have felt sticker shock after signing expensive long-term energy contracts with energy retailers. Last week, it was announced that the global adjustment, which is added to consumers' bills, will double to 8.72 cents per kilowatt hour. Wow. This means that families that are already feeling cheated by the shady tactics of these companies will be paying roughly 15 to 17 cents per kilowatt hour, 24 hours a day, nearly one-third more than the peak price being charged to other consumers by Hydro One. My question is simple. What steps will you take to help consumers? Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, the, uh, the government of Ontario is very cognizant of pressures on uh, the uh, electricity rates across the province. We've taken a number of very significant steps to protect uh, the families across the province. We've also got some very special uh, considerations for people in the northern part of the province. But the clean energy benefit, Mr. Speaker, Solid. generates a 10 percent discount off the bottom line of, uh, of, of uh, family bills, electricity bills across the province of Ontario. We actually have, as well, a Northern Ontario tax credit to assist people uh, who have uh, challenges meeting their electricity bills. Mr. Speaker, we are cognizant of the pressures. We've taken steps. We're going to keep those programs in place, Mr. Speaker, uh, and, and we'll go forward on that basis. Wow. Thank you, supplementary. Minister, electricity prices are high enough for those of us paying the market rate. But for those who are stuck with energy retailers, this really could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. The government has made changes, but the companies have just found new ways to break the rules. I've seen deceased customers sign up, house guests unwillingly sign up their hosts, even an Ontario Works Administrator sign up dozens of her clients. This needs to stop. Will the minister finally take the side of vulnerable consumers and put an end to the exploitive practices of energy retailers? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Consumer Affairs. Minister of Consumer Affairs. Good minister. I want to thank the member for the question, and I'm always interested in hearing more about how we can protect con consumers in Ontario. I've actually been in discussions with the Minister of Energy about fair pricing for consumers fair consumer practices so that consumers know their rights and that they know they know exactly what they're purchasing. I think uh, we have a strong record in Ontario of fair market practices in this area, but as I said, I'm always open to hearing more suggestions and happy to talk to the member further. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Oakville. Mr. Speaker, I've got a question this morning for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Speaker, in my riding of Oakville, our constituents are starting to see the real benefits of a growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. By implementing this growth plan, the province is creating conditions that bring a strong economy and a healthy environment. Now, I know the challenges we face in the Greater Golden Horseshoe are much different from those that are faced by Ontarians who live in Northern Ontario. Last month at AMO, I had the opportunity to engage with Northern Mayors, and we talked about the growth, the growth plan for the Northern uh, Ontario area. Will the minister please inform the House how government is working with Northerners to ensure the successful implementation of a growth plan specifically for Northern Ontario? Good question. Thank you, Minister. For you. I didn't think we'd get Member that. For, for the question, also uh, for joining us last month at AMO uh, in discussions with our northern mayors, and there's no question, Mr. Good Speaker, meeting. that certainly the, the the government under Premier Wynne uh, wants to continue to ensure that our northern communities uh, remain on a positive track toward yeah. prosperity and growth. Uh, when the Premier was in Thunder Bay uh, uh, last week, we had a great job this roundtable, Premier, uh, with, our, with our leadership talking about growth plan priorities and certainly the engagement of our northern mayors uh, and stakeholders is absolutely crucial. Uh, we're going to continue to, to work to, uh, to increase regional capacity uh, building. That's hugely important in terms of the investment opportunities and just specifically in terms of the, uh, uh, the things that we made, investments we've made related to the growth plan. Uh, annual funding of $100 million at Northern Ontario Heritage Fund to support projects that create jobs and investment has been crucial. Uh, uh, certainly, we have a regional economic uh, opportunities partnership initiative, uh, Speaker, that uh, will be 
supporting collaboration between communities by providing enhanced funding to partnership proposals. We've also got the uh, creation of the independent, not for profit, Northern Policy Institute, something Northerners called for and became part of our growth plan implementation, as well as a multimodal transportation strategy, which is hugely important and crucial, particularly as we work to uh, maintain a sustainable and efficient Ontario North Transportation Commission. So, Speaker, we're very grateful for the opportunities we have to increase prosperity in Northern yep. Ontario. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. Earlier at question period, my leader was asking a question to the Premier in regards to expanding the scope of committee. I want to make this point. At no time in that question was she calling into question your decision of yesterday, your decision in regards to what you were deciding in regards to the discussions you had with Mr. Jean were the subject of your discussion yesterday. It is within the purview of this House, Mr. Speaker, and within the purview of the standing orders by which the way that the committees have power. The committees are able to sit and do the things that they do because they're in the standing orders, but this House has the authority to be able to expand the scope of the committee, and that falls within our right as members. And I just want to put you on note. Uh, you, you don't need to put me on notice because I will explain clearly to the member. Uh, because uh, he rose when he shouldn't have rose, rised. Uh, the matter of the alleged intimidation of the speaker had been dealt with. My perception, my perception was that the leader of the third party was going there. And I asked her, well, you can say no all you want. I had a perception as speaker that the member was going there. I asked her to change or modify her question, which she did, and I'm thankful that she did do that, and that's the point in which I stopped her to do it. So you do not need to put me on notice because I made the perception that she was going down a route, road that was already ruled on. So I'll leave it at that. The member from the and Carleton on a point of order. I do notice that my friend has left the gallery, but Ed Sem is visiting from uh, British Columbia. He's a former colleague of mine when we worked for Joe Clark many years ago. For second time around, not the first. We have. Uh, Attorney General. I'm standing. We have a deferred vote on the motion from Ms. McCharles for second reading of Bill 55, an act to amend the Collective Agencies Act, the Consumer Protection Act 2002, and the Real Estate and Business Brokers Act 2002, and to make consequential amendments to other acts. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
Yeah, I would have helped. <laughs> Members take their seats, please. Members, take your seats, please. I thank you. On April the 23rd, Ms. McCharles moves second reading of Bill 55. All those in favor, rise. Please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. 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 Garrison. Mr. Garrison. Mrs. Jeffrey. Mrs. Jeffrey. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Madame Mayer. Madame Mayer. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Peruzza. Mr. Peruzza. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Padre. Mr. Padre. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Nackfi. Mr. Nackfi. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mrs. Elliott. Mrs. Elliott. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Miller, Perry, Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry, Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Willett. Mr. Willett. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. McKenna. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. You should be sung. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Navishka. Mr. Navishka. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Shine. Mr. Shine. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 96, the nays are 0. Wow. The ayes being 96 and the nays being 0, I declare the motion carried. Uh, shall, the, shall, the, shall, the, shall, the, shall the bill be ordered for third reading? Ms. McCharles. Be referred to the Standing Committee of the Legislative Assembly. Agreed. So ordered. There are no further... There are no further deferred votes. This house stands adjourned until 1 p.m. This is 3 p.m. this afternoon.